Well, the Razorbacks are getting better, but they still lose to Baylor. So does it really matter at this point? You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 103.7 The Buzz and 1037thebuzz.com. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can help and get more qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your 2023 goals. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. Terms and conditions do apply. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend, and I know for Razorback basketball, it uh, wasn't it wasn't a great one again, and it, it's just kind of getting to the point to where, uh, you know, we, we're we're trying to figure out what to make of this team, and I know we'll get into some details here in just a second, but first, with Arkansas losing sixty seven to sixty four against Baylor on the road, it's a weird feeling that at least I have. I don't know if a lot of you share the same feelings that I do, but it does make me feel like in a loss like this I'm still not mad I'm not like frustrated in the regard of saying that this team is terrible it's a weird like I'm still kind of hopeful still kind of thinking that it'll be better and it'll get better and it'll be fine and I don't know if I should like they're 14 and 7 they've still yet to have a marquee win this year they are sitting at 3 and 5 in conference play so why am I feeling hopeful? Like that's, it's kind of a weird feeling. Again, I don't know if you have it too. Maybe you completely disagree with me, but it's just one of those deals to maybe because of the injuries, maybe because of what Arkansas has been doing and how they've been playing. It, it just kind of makes it at least a little bit more understandable at this point in time. And we'll talk about some of the other elements of this game too, but looking at the specifics, Arkansas, I was down there in Waco for one. And uh, Arkansas did a lot of great things in this game. Like they did so many things that, we're putting them in good position to win. Ricky Council had a Maui Ricky Council game. We've been waiting for him to bring it back out and do really well. He had 25 points in this game, 10 of 17 from the field, two of four from three-point land, hit all of his free throws, had a rebound, had an assist, only one turnover. So Ricky offensively was the Ricky Council that we have all known to love and appreciate, uh, definitely. And then Devo Davis also had 16 points in this game. And he played 36 minutes, shot a lot, shot too many threes, which again, it goes back to the whole thing of like, well, he didn't make two, so he went two of seven, so it's not too bad, but still goes six of 13 from the field. Does have two rebounds and four assists, so really good from him. But what killed him was turnovers. Five turnovers for Devo Davis in this game. Anthony Black also played the majority of the game. 35 minutes for him. He had seven points, six rebounds, three assists, two turnovers, one steal for him. He goes three of seven from the field, uh, so only had seven points. So didn't have a whole lot of scoring, but still defensively, he did a really good job. Now, after that, like Jordan Walsh had another uh, pretty rough game. You know, only four points, but he, he had two block shots in this game and a steal. He was in foul trouble. And again, we'll talk about that here in just a second about the officiating. But he wasn't able to play as many minutes as I'm sure Muss and the rest of the team needed him to play. So instead, Arkansas had to go to the bench and look at Jalen Graham, a guy who a lot of people have been calling for him to play. And he played really great, but four points, you probably see that. And you're like, how do you say that he played really great, especially when he goes, oh, a four from the free throw line? That's brutal. That's brutal. Well, he had nine rebounds in this game, four assists, and two steals. And usually for a big man that's playing 25 minutes, roughly, that's not the type of game that you usually expect to see out of him. But did some nice things, made some differences there, especially defensively. And uh, I think he had a huge impact in this game, too. Mikel Mitchell came in, too. Uh, for played more than Makai Mitchell, and he also had a, had a pretty nice game for four points, seven rebounds, two assists for him, three block shots, uh, only went two of three from the field, so didn't shoot a whole lot. So a, a really good game out of him. And then uh, Jordan Walsh mentioned him. Makai Mitchell didn't play a whole lot. He also was in foul trouble. Uh, Kamani, Pinion, all those guys. You know, it just they they were able to do a lot of good things, and I think defensively was especially impressive because Baylor is a team that shoots really high percentages and scores a ton of points. They were averaging around 80 points per game and Arkansas held them to 67 points. And the, if you want to just look at again, box scores and try to point to one thing that or two things, whatever it may be that had Arkansas losing this game, 
It's a very simple thing. Free throws. That's what was the difference. Baylor goes 21 of 24 from free throw stripe, and Arkansas goes 6 of 11. So you're talking about 15 points. 15 points more by Baylor in this game at the free throw line than what Arkansas had, and they lost by three. Arkansas made seven more field goals than Baylor in this one. 27 of 53 for Arkansas, 20 of 59 for Baylor. So if you want to compare the percentages, Arkansas shot 51% from the field. Baylor shot 34%. 17 percentage points difference in what they were hitting from the field. Three-point percentage was Baylor's favored by a little bit, but they still didn't shoot great. They went 6 of 18, 33%. Arkansas goes 29% at 4 of 14, so it wasn't great. But it came down to free throws. And Baylor getting to the free throw line and making all their free throws at a high clip, uh, that's the type of difference that was made in this game tremendously. Arkansas did a really good job. Defensively, awesome. They, they keep getting better, and that's what makes it so frustrating because Baylor's a really good team. They're a top 25 team. They, they did a lot of good things to – you know, get to this point and have some nice wins. They're on a winning streak right now. They're very well coached. But Arkansas, I think, did exactly what they needed to do against Baylor. It's just when you get to the free throw lines that many times and you're able to make that many free throws, that ends up being the difference. And I just, I was there in Waco and it was frustrating to watch. But it becomes to a question, which we'll talk about here as far as officiating and fouling and everything. Can Arkansas overcome this type of thing to try to get through and, and to, to make it work? We'll, ha we'll have to see. It, it's, it's one thing to keep talking about it and bringing it up, but it is a factor that goes into this game as well. Arkansas had more assists. They had, Arkansas had 16 assists in this game, only five for Baylor. Arkansas did turn the ball over 15 times to compared to Baylor's eight, but here's the kicker to that. Arkansas had 11 turnovers in the first half, and they had a lead at halftime. Arkansas was leading 33-27 at halftime. Both teams only had four turnovers in the second half. So you're talking about where the time where Arkansas had the most turnovers and were having problems the most in the first half, Arkansas still had a four point or a six point lead uh, going into halftime. So they were able to at least overcome and weather that storm with the amount of turnovers that they had. Arkansas had six block shots. Baylor had one. Arkansas only had four steals, but Baylor did have seven. Um, rebounding was exactly the same, 35 for both teams uh, in that regard. Like it's it's just the weirdest thing when you look at this box score and see a lot of the the comparisons and how close it was. Uh, Baylor had 13 points off turnover. Arkansas only had eight uh, points in the paint. Arkansas had 34. Baylor had 22. Second chance points. Baylor got 12. Arkansas got five. That was big. Fast breaks. 10 to five. Baylor had the lead there too. Bench points. Eight to five. Arkansas actually had uh, the the significant change there too. But it was just it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for Arkansas to overcome. They were down by 11 in the first half. Arkansas was. Storm back in it, and they were able to take the lead. But uh, it's just, if it's not one thing, it's another. I keep comparing it to some type of leak that you have in a pipe system where as soon as you feel like, okay, I got this leak taken care of, or at least this leak is not a problem for me this time, another leak pops open and it ends up being a problem. So it's just all over the place and trying to figure this whole thing out. And I don't know. I'm, I'm encouraged by it. Arkansas went down there and gave Baylor all that they wanted, play better than. I think a lot of people expected. I was going into it not really expecting Arkansas to win, if I'm going to be honest about it, just because of how Baylor plays and how going on the road uh, in the SEC Big 12 Challenge has not been great for Arkansas. So I wasn't expecting them to win. But I did not expect them to play as well as they did defensively against Baylor. That was kind of the thing that I was a little bit like suspect about. But Arkansas had a good matchup. They had what they wanted. like They got what they wanted. It just wasn't enough in the end. So, uh, but we'll talk about the officiating in a second, but I do want to say this, and this may come off as mean uh, and mean spirited. I know we had Drake toll of locked on Baylor on last week, and he's really, he's a really good guy and does a really good job with that podcast. But I'm going to tell you folks that if you were there, maybe you can understand what I'm talking about. I've never seen a more pathetic excuse for a crowd when it comes to attendance numbers and considering where the program's at, than what I saw Baylor have on Saturday. Now, it was pretty full. In fact, I saw the attendance numbers. It was like one person shy of their all-time record, which is weird because there I saw a lot of empty seats. Not like a lot as far as like huge spaces, but you could look around and see some good amount of empty seats. But Arkansas fans 
made up about 25% or more of that crowd. And I'm not kidding about that. The amount of you Razorback fans that showed up was awesome. That was awesome. And kudos to all of you of making the trip. You could hear the hog calls. You could hear the cheers. It was really impressive. But how pathetic is that? Where you have a Baylor basketball program two years ago won the national championship. And here you are two years later. You're a top 20 team in the country, probably going to be even higher. You're on a win streak. You just beat Kansas at home. It's a Saturday afternoon at three o'clock in your arena. The weather is fine. And you make up your crowd makes up about 65, 70% of the crowd at home. Could you imagine what that Razorback basketball crowd would have been like if you flipped the roles and Arkansas won a national championship two years ago and Arkansas was a top 20 team that just were, was coming off of a big win against Bama or Kentucky or whoever. And then it was a three o'clock afternoon game at Bud Walton Arena. Do you think that the crowd would be 25, 30% Baylor in Bud Walton Arena? Do you think that there would be empty seats around on a Saturday in the SEC Big 12 Challenge? Absolutely not. So not that it matters. Baylor did enough to win the game, and the atmosphere was fine. I was just extremely disappointed. I could not believe that. I, I couldn't believe it. It's unreal. And it's not like their arena is massive. I think it only holds like 10, 12, uh, 10 11,000 people. So it wasn't massive. What was the excuse? What's it going to take? A national championship two years ago. And that's the best you can do? I was very disappointed by that. Again, not that it matters in the end, but just something that stood out to me. And uh, I was probably, I could not believe that. Just weird, because again, I'm looking at it from an Arkansas lens. Like, I just that doesn't even compute. Like Arkansas had a blizzard against LSU, a terrible basketball team, and Arkansas was still able to put like 13,000 people in the stands. Just doesn't make, and that was in the middle of the week. It was in the middle of the week. Just does not, this does not make any, any sense whatsoever. So, folks, this year, the only app that you need at your Super Bowl party is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're really excited about announcing our new sports betting partner here on the Locked On Podcast because they're the number one sports book in all of America, and it is FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better because they have so many great features to make betting on sports fun and easy. Download FanDuel now so you can bet the Super Bowl and check out all the great things that they have going on for it with a no sweat first bet is what they like to call it you'll get up to three thousand dollars back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win so FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who will score first touchdown and it's a safe secure and super easy to use app which is always very important now i know some of you are saying it's like okay well i live in arkansas FanDuel's not available well that's true but there's so many of you podcast listeners here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast that live outside the state of Arkansas, to which FanDuel is av available to you. So you have to check it out. It's the best one there is. And you get paid in your winnings instantly. You know, the Super Bowl is going to be coming out between the Chiefs as well as the Eagles. And I can't wait to see all the different prop bets. You're going to have like things going on when it comes to, you know, national anthem singings and, you know, will there be a streaker on the field? There's going to be all different types of uh, bets and parlays that you can make and you can do it all. On FanDuel. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your first no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports book partner of the NFL. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so moving on into the next segment of the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Let's talk officiating, folks. Let's talk officiating. Um, in this game in particular with Arkansas and Baylor, yes, there were a massive difference in fouls, and especially in foul calls that got Baylor to the free throw line, where Baylor shot 15, or excuse me, 13 more free throws, made 15 more, and Arkansas got into foul trouble, especially early. So ridiculous enough that Arkansas had seven fouls committed. So Baylor was in the bonus with 14.39 left to go in the game. 14.39 left to go in the game. You had uh, an incident where Jordan Walsh got called for two fouls without a second getting taken off the clock, to which he had to come out. He and Makai Mitchell both fouled out. Makai Mitchell fouled out with his fifth 
when he was just racing for the ball and, and a loose ball, which I'm not saying it was a bad call, but just a hustle play that was unfortunate that he got called for his fifth foul. And also Jalen Graham and Mikel Mitchell both got called for four fouls in this game too. So he had a huge difference here. And also Musk got a tech in this game and the first half for arguing one of the worst calls I've seen and, and maybe this year, one of them at least, to where it was a clear as crystal charge against Mikel Mitchell. But instead, Baylor gets the call there. I believe they got the and one. I'm not totally sure, but it was just egregious. Like it was a textbook charge. Does not get called. Musk gets frustrated, gets teed up. And, uh, you know, that ended up being uh, something that Arkansas just had to deal with the rest of the time. Now, this has been an ongoing theme. In fact, Musk has even said in the press conference he's done talking about the officiating, and I don't blame him. I don't blame him for being done. I don't like I complain about officiating across the board. You know, I I, I do. It's bad and it's gonna give you a part of the game. But this year it's been really bad, and I'm getting kind of sick and tired of having to talk about it. But it's not that I'm just choosing to talk about it and saying that, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to nitpick here about officiating and find just the smallest of examples of why they screwed up. This is an ongoing theme, and it's not just with Arkansas. It's in college basketball in general. And how I always gauge it and how I look at it is on social media, if I'm the only one that's like, as far as media people go, if I'm the only one that's complaining about officiating, then maybe, just maybe, it's just me looking at it through a bias or through a lens or through a fanboy type of thing. But if it's something to where... I see national college basketball experts and writers and people also commenting on the terrible officiating. That's when I know that there's some justification to it because they have no bias. They have no reason to just, you know, say, oh, well, uh, you know, this is why I'm thinking Arkansas is getting screwed because I'm rooting for them. It, it has nothing to do with that. There were calls in this game that were so egregious going against Arkansas that it makes it extremely frustrating when you're a team like Arkansas, trying to get over that hump, and these are the things that are holding you back. Now, I'll also say Arkansas does foul too much, so I'm not saying that every foul call is not justified. I am not saying that Arkansas plays perfect defense all the time and has zero uh, fouls that ever actually occur. Like I'm not saying any of that. They do foul a lot. They need to try to not do that as much. That's a fact. But I also think that they do play really good defense and they don't change in the way that they play from game to game. That's where I come in to where it's it's getting out of control. Like I did not see anything that Arkansas did against Baylor defensively that they didn't do against LSU earlier this week, yet there were like half the foul calls. That's the stuff that I just don't understand. And then there's big plays and in big moments where – it changes the game tremendously. I mentioned the bonus, for instance, 14 and a half minutes left to go in the game, and Baylor's already in the bonus. You can't sit there and tell me that that does not impact the way that Arkansas has to play defense going forward the rest of the way. That now also impacts who's going to be in the game in the rotations. Jordan Walsh getting two fouls and no time going off the clock where he gets four fouls called on him and has to come out of the game. You can't tell me that that's not a huge impact. And also, think of the Makai Mitchell play where he gets called for his fifth foul. Now, again, I believe it was a foul call, but because of how the game was called earlier, that play, which was 90 feet almost away from the basket, that foul call then gives free throws to Baylor. A hustle play so far away from the goal gives free throws to Baylor because earlier in the half, they were calling fouls like they were going out of style. Those are the things that just impact the game tremendously. I get sick and tired of that. I get tired of watching games and games and games and doing this podcast day after day after time after time after week after week, having to sit here and talk about officiating and how it does play a major role. It hasn't done it in every game. It hasn't even done it in every loss that Arkansas's had. Like, I'll even go out on a limb and say maybe three, four possibly games this year have been impacted by officiating. I think the Creighton loss in Maui, we did a podcast on that was awful and that stretch that they had horrible i think that this game the officiating was was pretty poor for the most part i think the officiating in that missouri game was horrendous so there are games where arkansas has lost that had nothing to do with it like i still think arkansas lost fair and square to alabama i think they lost fair and square to auburn 
Uh, you know, I think they lost fair and square to Vanderbilt. Like Vanderbilt just goes like, so it's not every loss, but there have been losses where it has directly impacted the game. And this was one of them. I don't understand what Arkansas is going to have to do because Muss is a phenomenal coach. He's one of the best coaches in the country. And I would not trade him with any other person, any other coach in college basketball. The dude is incredible. We all know that he's a genius. He knows how to coach and he especially knows how to coach incredible defense because that has been how Arkansas has had so much success under Eric Musselman is his defensive coaching and his ability to put guys in really great positions. I know that I trust him in that. So this year there hasn't been anything differently that he's coached these guys. Like the inconsistency is what bothers me. And I can't imagine how difficult it is to where you have a game plan. You go into the game. You're like, hey, we had this defensive stuff that really worked. We got confidence against LSU because we played really good defense. Let's build upon that going into this game. We'll have some similar game plans. We'll have some guys that really match up really well. We'll have some inside presence there, too. We'll put it all together. We got a great game plan. We are ready for this game, which I think Arkansas did a phenomenal job of putting together a game plan for Baylor. But once you get into the game, and especially in the second half, you have a lead, you're feeling good. You felt like, hey, we had some mistakes in the first half, but the fact that we have a lead, shore those mistakes up and we're ready to go. And then boom, 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 boom. Seven fouls, 1439 to go. Some of your key players already with a high amount of fouls. And then you have to change everything. You got to say, guys, sorry, babe, scale back the defense, scale back the aggressiveness. Jordan Walsh, Kai Mitchell, got to come out. Jalen Graham, we're going to count on you. Like it, it just changes everything in every aspect of this game. And Muss is is tired of the talking about the officiating. And again, I am too. Like I, I just, I'm not saying that Arkansas lost this game necessarily just because of the officiating. That's another thing people just say. It's like, oh, the officials had nothing to do with it. Yeah, it, it, they had something to do with it. It's not everything, but they had something. And I just don't know how you can watch that game and not look at the amount of free throws that Baylor took in this game compared to Arkansas, which that's another thing. Arkansas is a more of a drive, attack the basket type of team. Baylor is not, and yet they got more foul calls. They got more free throws. How does that make sense? Like, it should be the team that's more aggressive in driving the basketball get a lot more free throws, and that didn't happen. So I, I'm just, I'm getting to the point to where it's like, you may just have to change everything. Just change up the defense, change up everything. Because it's just, it's just not, it's not a good product. It's not good for anybody. And again, I want to reiterate, not saying that the officials are the only reason Arkansas lost this game. But are they a reason why they lost this game? Yeah. And are they a reason Arkansas has lost games this year? Yeah. Both can be true. But what a frustrating thing to deal with, and hoping so, or hopefully Arkansas finds a way to overcome it, too. It's just a really annoying. Uh, we're going to close up shop and wrap around the Big 12 and SEC Challenge and how it went here on the other side of the break. So stay with us here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast uh, over the weekend, SEC Big 12 Challenge. What a stupid weekend. Uh, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. The majority of the home teams won these games, but SEC did not do enough to win the SEC Big 12 Challenge, the final SEC Big 12 Challenge. So as we know, Arkansas lost uh, by uh, to Baylor by three. Now, some games just didn't make any freaking sense whatsoever. Oklahoma beat Bama 93-69. to they were up by like 30 at one point in time. Alabama, who's been unstoppable, who have been one of the best looking teams in all of college basketball, gets trounced by an Oklahoma team that Arkansas beat earlier this year that's not good whatsoever. Like they were 11 and 9 going in this game. They get smoked. What a weird deal. Happens in college basketball, but still, I was not expecting it to be against Oklahoma. Tennessee takes care of business against Texas at home. Uh, Tennessee's really good. Like Bama and Tennessee are, are the best teams in the SEC, and it's not close. So if neither of those teams make the final force, like it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Uh, Kansas State beat Florida and Florida gave them all that they wanted. Kansas State's a top five team too. Uh, 64-50. Kansas State takes care of business there at home, but Florida, give them credit. They're also starting to improve. Kansas goes on the road to beat Kentucky. This was a good back and forth game, but too much uh, Kansas and too uh, many great plays late because Kansas got hot from three, especially late, and it just wasn't enough. So big win for Kansas to get back on track. Mississippi State beats TCU. Okay. 
A 12 and 8 Mississippi State team beats a TCU team that was a top 15 team. Okay. It went to overtime 81 74. Missouri beats Iowa State, smokes them 78 61. Okay. Iowa State, who is the number 12 team in the country, doesn't make sense. Okay. West Virginia, 12 and 8, beats Auburn. Uh, 80 to 77. Okay. Hate to see it too. That's, that's crazy. It must've been their Super Bowl. Uh, but West Virginia takes care of business there. Texas tech goes on the road to beat LSU. The basketball gods were not kind with that game. What a trashy game. And LSU is so bad. That's the thing I'm telling you, it's going to, it's going to happen where LSU literally goes one in 17 this year in sec play and their one win is going to be against Arkansas. It's so dumb. Ugh, disgusting. Uh, Georgia beat South Carolina. They didn't play into the uh, sec. Uh, Big 12 challenge. Oklahoma State get to go on the road and trounce Ole Miss 82 to 60. And AM barely squeaked by for Vanderbilt. I think Vanderbilt's an improved team, but AM's pretty good. And that's who Arkansas welcomes in once again. This would they got to beat Texas AM. If they want to really get back on track, they got to beat Texas AM. I mean, we have to switch it over. Uh, they got to. Like, if they don't do that, then I, I don't know what else to think. <laughs> like, they got to have some quality wins. And this is, this is, you have to win these home games against quality opponents because the only ones you got left again at home is AM and Kentucky. Really? I mean, that's it. Those are really the only three, two that you have left at home. And then you still go to Kentucky, to A&M, to Tennessee, to Bama. So it's tough, man. It's tough right now. I'm hoping that they get it back together. But anyway, it's not a great weekend for the SEC in that regard, but that's fine. Who cares? Moving on. Rest of the SEC play. The big stretch of SEC games are coming up next. Appreciate everybody listening in to Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at Buzz John Neighbors for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see.